Hello, everyone. Great to see you all. I know uh, many of you, or some of you, great to see many new faces, too. Uh, thank you for coming out today. Uh, this is a great expression of interest and curiosity, and I hope contribution, because uh, uh, we want to encourage you to, to pose questions or challenges to the panelists as we go forward. So think about what you might want to uh, write on those little cards and send them up forward. I'm not sure of the system of how you do so, but uh, don't be shy. Uh, my name is Gordon Chang. I'm a professor of history and humanities here at Stanford, and recently uh, the senior, associ senior associate vice provost for undergraduate education. I tell you, it was not fun being in administration during COVID. <laughs> and the last time I spoke in this auditorium was a pleasant occasion, actually. It's a beautiful auditorium here in the business school. Uh, and I spoke to a whole f room full of undergraduates about Chinese railroad workers in Leland Stanford. And so the irony of talking about them and their contribution and their association with the university was an irony that was not lost upon me. Neither has the discussion today, the previous panel, in which there was discussion about imperialism, racism, all sorts of phobias and hate and identity not lost on me too. Uh, the irony of doing so at, here at Stanford and I appreciated <laughs> Dorothy Wong's comment about uh, interrogation about gratefulness. So a lot to think about there. So it's my great pleasure um, to moderate, to chair this panel. I want to keep my comments brief because the panels really are the focus. Three four great artists. One I want to say, unfortunately, could not be here today, Nancy Hom, because she came down last night with COVID and wrote us that she was unavailable and wanted to, uh, had to stay home up in San Francisco. But I will read her paper. Uh, we have uh, today uh, Howie Chen, Nancy Hom, Arlen Huang, and Tiffany Xia, um, who will present about 10 minutes each, uh, all artists of uh, fascinating, challenging work. Uh, so it is a different sort of presentation um, than we heard earlier uh, this afternoon. Uh, I, and then after they uh, present, I'll come back with some thoughts and reflections or a question or two. And then we'll open it up to you. And so we really do mean that, and we want questions to come forward uh, to the panelists. I, I can't ventriloquate or substitute for Nancy, so I don't know we can pose questions to her, but she's, I think, hopefully she's, this is being streamed live, these panels are being streamed live, so she might get to hear a comment if you have one for her uh, that she can hear. So uh, let, beyond, uh, so let's uh, have the speakers come out. Um, the first uh, will be Howie Chen, uh, whose book, Godzilla, Asian American Arts Network, a fabulous new publications outside, and he will be the first speaker uh, and then Nancy, I'll come back and give uh, Nancy's paper. Arlen Huang uh, will be next after Nancy's paper. And then lastly, Tiffany Xia, who will come up. Uh, so Arle, uh, uh, Howie, come on up and uh, get, to, get us going. Thank you, Gordon. Let me just get set up a little bit here. Oh, great. Thank you, Gordon, for that introduction. And it's an honor to participate on a panel with you and every participant here, gathered to think about different kinds of activisms and how it intersects with the field of art. I'm grateful that Marcy Kwan invited me to this ambitious conference and for, to invite me to also assemble the panel today. I particularly enjoyed uh, the conversation with Marcy in mapping the different voices necessary to intimate the historical and contemporary ideas of what constitutes activism and the different forms those activities take. Um, when I was invited by Marcy to organize the panel, I made one request to modify the panel name from Art and Activism to Art Activisms to reflect on the multitude of forms of being socially and politically active in the world. Certainly on this panel, the important collective activisms of the Kearney Street Workshop, 
Basement Workshop and Godzilla are well represented and take the familiar image of social and cultural activism. I'm so honored to be in dialogue with these, collect these collective legacies. In addition, I'm also interested in forms of immaterial refusals and even invisible activisms that don't fit neatly in recognizable images or even register at the level of collectivity. This includes activisms within the field of art that take up specific political stakes in the realm of abstraction, discourse, and what I see is, is the quantum level of activism, which is the individual. And this is where I see the artistic and writing practice of Tiffany Shah, or my work as an art curator and editor, come in dialogue with collective forms of activism. Another reason to consider different modes of activisms for me was inspired by philosopher Hannah Arendt's idea of vita activa from her well-known work, The Human Condition. In this book, she discusses the importance and ethics of an active life, vita activa, and how the, the practice of, its, of it is crucial to what we call the social, a life together with others. For Arendt, the individual practice of vita activa is the life of speech and action. It is the practice of creating and actualizing new capacities of freedom and plurality. Freedom meaning the capacity to begin anew, to give form to new identities, and plurality meaning creating new ways to relate to each other, with a horizon for constituting new forms of the social. For me, this is, this is an activism at the quantum, quantum level of the individual in the form of discourse and action. In terms of Vita Activa in the art field, I'd like to focus on examples of how curators and artists can possibly present different forms of being in the world. And in this case, how one can exceed over-determining conditions such as hegemonic identity categories, which includes Asian American as a racial classifier, the ossification of historical narratives, and even illiberal modes that are now functioning in one's progressive projects in academia and cultural institutions such as museums. Today I'll be focusing on a photograph, an excerpt, of an original manuscript I, I submitted to Art Forum on the art of photographer Jared Liu. The article was later published this summer in July as a highly edited version that to me is a product of nuanced discursive struggle and an artifact of master narratives concerning Asian American art and identity that needs to be examined. As a writer approaching Jared Liu's work, I was interested in how his photography might short circuit his own personal family history or sidestep easy narratives of identity and representation, specifically the curious racecraft of Asian American as a national and racial category, and point to the proliferation of other ways of being in the world as an individual while bring ontological capaciousness to others. And as you will see in here, I'll, I bury the lead in this article and you'll soon discover Jared's personal lodestar and how I attempted to thread the whole aesthetic and philosophical thrust of the piece through the quantum of the particular and into the many by focusing on the politics of the face and memory that exceeds the predominance of Asian American identity. This article is an attempt to subvert the genre of personal account and race that we have come to associate with Asian American art and literature and to use these literary devices to deterritorialize identity itself. To think about how we can possibly deface and reface identity and its history with its own tools. So if you can indulge me, I'll, I'll, um, I've, I put together an abridged uh, manuscript that, that um, went to art forum and went through the mill. And we can talk about that later, about how even in the editing process, certain um, kind of hegemonic narratives about Asian American identity and culture um, gets overcoded into the final product. Okay. I've gone 47 years without remembering the ages of my parents. Their birthdays and history continue to elude my best efforts to commit these things to stable memory. During the height of the pandemic, I obtained copies of their birth certificates for a passport application in hopes of decamping to another country because necropolitics in the United States was accelerating at an alarming rate. As with most plans detoured by the vicissitudes of COVID, my move never materialized, and I am now left with a file of documents detailing my parents' origins. Even with this information in plain sight, their history remains an emporia to me. This contradiction stems perhaps from 
their psychically unindexed past in post-revolution China, martial law era Taiwan, and immigration to the United States. I often find myself staring at these legal documents in a private ritual that yields, that yields no real image for these dates and, and places. It is a persistent blind spot for me. It is a memorial void that blots the surface of everyday life. This blind spot also appears in the photographer Jared Liu's family portrait series, In Between You and Your Shadow, which features the obscured presence of his mother in various constructed scenes in their suburban Detroit home. There are pictures in which a lens flare or stray reflection washes out her face, interrupting her capture in the frame. In other photographs, objects in the foreground, plant foliage, furniture, a wall, mediate access to her full countenance. Her refusal is clear in Untitled Mother and Son 2021, where she turns her back to avert the gaze of the viewer. Instead of seeing her face in direct spotlight, we are presented with a curtain of long black hair and her blank shadows on the wall, creating a feeling of unfathomable interiority. About 10 years earlier, Liu had uncovered details of his mother's past that revealed something ineffable about his immediate family. There had been a great loss. From an inadvertent text message from his cousin, Liu learned that his mother had known a person named Vincent Chin over 30 years ago. Unfamiliar with everything mentioned in their text exchange, Liu quickly Googled Vincent Chin, and one of the first results he viewed was a 1982 newspaper article reporting the tragic murder of Chin in Detroit, featuring a headline that read, Slaying Ends Couples Dreams. In the accompanying photo of the front page story, Liu immediately recognized the image of his mother, who was identified as Chin's fiance. This revelation began casting shadows across Liu's world as he sought to learn more about his mother's past and make sense of his life and identity in relation to this event. This is what Liu quickly learned from the internet 30, on the 30th anniversary of Chin's death. It would take another four years before he could approach his mother about her past and the tragedy, had been, and the tragedy that had been kept outside the frame of his life. And during that time, his photography practice, his photography practice shifted to explore the nature of unspeakable loss and the melancholic solitude that besets a society unable to mourn the death of people, industries, and cities. How do you photograph your mother without photographing your mother? Liu has grappled with this question that taps into the impossible task of making visible something or someone that resists representation. Literary critic David Ang describes this as a, the very condition of racial melancholia, which unresolved historical traumas of loss grief and forgetting haunt the unconscious of generations. He explains that although we, we may know who has been lost, we may never know what, exactly what has been lost in ourselves. The long shadows that loom in the interiors of Lou's family portraits are traces of this in, indefinable loss, imbuing the photographs with fugitive feelings. Although we are unable to see the entirety of his mother's face, her metaphysical visage saturates each scene including the ones in which she is physically absent. The plate of hand-cut fruit, the stone fireplace mantle, and the apparitional ceramic Buddha all become part of the extended terrain of her subjectivity. Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari describe the face as not a dis discrete site on the body, but rather an abstract map that can transform the surrounding landscape into zones of, of effective intensity. Accordingly, all cinematic close-up shots even without a clear subject, are, to them, affection images of the face, produced by the forces of signification and subjectivity that act together as a machine to encode everything with facial potentiality. The intertwined relationship between the face and the landscape is evident in Liu's Please Take Off Your Shoes series, in which solitary Asian subjects photographed in the stark environments of their bedrooms are juxtaposed with still life interiors of their eclectically decorated homes. Amidst a bricolage of imported lacquer furniture, ink scroll paintings, and Buddhist effects, Liu isolates his focus on young Asian American subjects, ranging in different ages, sexuality, ethnicities, who have agreed to take part in his study of diasporic loneliness and social alienation in the city where Chin once lived. In these tightly staged scenes, people stare ambivalently into the camera 
while others turn away or remain out of the frame, never fully revealing themselves. Against the drab backdrop of, the, of suburban Detroit, Liu's attempt to locate what is Asian in these domestic spaces remains elusive because it does not reside in the assemblage of orientalized decor, nor does it reside in the racialized bodies that appear for the camera as an, as an essential substance. The blank bedroom wall and the cluttered living room yield no concrete things to the viewer. They are all part of a colonized American landscape in, sh in which we continually search for legible faces and material commonalities in hopes of conjuring the phantom of racial identity. Without an object attached to this experience, we are always left with a feeling in search of an image. In a contemplative disquisition on Ria Tajiri's history and memory for, for Akiko and Takashige, 1991, Ang describes photography as a type of performative image, performative imaging of loss that defies conventional representation and identity politics. Instead of operating in the realm of traditional documentary, photographs can create an embodied archive of knowledge and feelings. Both mother and daughter in the film share symptomatic blind spots stemming from the trauma of Japanese internment of, the, of World War II in their family. As a result, images and memories are discontinuous for them, and their relationship is forged by psychic forfeitures endured in private. For Aang, the photography can present a, histi a histiography of feelings that returns individuated racial melancholia back to the domain of the social through new emotional shapes and forms. And in the end of Tajiri's history of, and memory, the mother is re-signified through different affected correspondences in, in the images that intimates an alternative, an alternative mode of becoming that exceeds her unrepresentable history and, and memories. Um, in the same way, the partial appearance of Lou's mother in his photographs expresses the tension between the public narrative of her widowed past and the, pri and the private sovereignty of her current life without disavowing either beings. Despite the camera's facializing ins insistence to inscribe legible representation and identity in each frame, we are presented with modes of opacity that intimate a kinship of quiet refusal and unfixedness in the world. And this is the powerful, this is the powerful possibility in an age of snap-to-grid identity politics and racially flattened flattening violence. One can be a historical subject with new futurities and representations. I like to end, this, the manuscript ends um, with this one photograph, Gracie 2019 by Liu, in which the face of a young Korean adoptee is obscured by a white beauty mask as she poses in her dining room. Instead of an overdetermined face, we are presented with a metaphysical blank screen from which a multiplicity of deterritorialized faces proliferate in the photograph's strange misanbime. Although we do not see Gracie's face, we can feel the complexity of her ambivalent subjectivity. Um, yeah, that's, that's, and then if you see, um, if you get a chance to read the Art Forum article, everything is reordered in a way that is, is telling about how um, identity and um, the narrative as an apparatus transforms um, something that um, essentially buries the lead, but there's a desire for something um, clear in terms of identity and representation that is um, larger than um, the particular activism on a quantum level. Um, so thanks very much. Uh, I should mention that the speakers are speaking in alphabetical order. If you were wondering about how we chose them to speak, it's just purely alphabetical. You can make the connections yourselves. Uh, uh, now I'm Nancy Hom. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Stanford and, and the Asian American Arts Initiative for inviting me to speak at the Symposium at the Arts and Activism panel. Although I am known for my silkscreen posters, I'm going to talk about my Mandela work that I've been doing for the past 10 years, uh, specifically focus focusing on the Japantown Mandela 
that I created in 2015 for the Sweet J Town, Sweet spelled S U I T E, J Town, you know, short for Japan Town, project produced by Mark Izu and Brenda Wong Aoki of First Voice. Uh, this is Full Mandela, slide one, photo by Bob Chiang. I have created roughly 25 to 30 mandalas since 2012. They range in size from 2.5 feet to 12 feet in diameter and in topic from the personal to the collective. I started out depicting my own life transitions but realized that the art form is a great tool for building community and fostering collective healing. Why? The medium of a mandala leads itself to multiple layers of interpretation. It can affirm identity, tell a story, and educate the public on topical issues or physical places. Seen as a whole, the art form offers a bird's eye view of a collective situation as seen through our individual experiences. The mandala focuses people toward one center and helps them realize that no matter where they are in these concentric circles or how they differ, they are all they are, as individuals, they are not alone, but part of an interdependent network. Each row of carefully chosen objects has to work with the adjacent rows. Because the objects and rows can be replaced, this makes it an ideal art form to express relationships to changing situations. By having community members make some of the items in the mandala, they are not only viewers of art, but active participants as well. Their involvement gives the work artwork vitality. What? The 10-foot Japantown mandala uh, was made of hundreds of little objects placed on the gallery floor so that viewers can walk around it and see it from above. It was the centerpiece of Sweet J-Town, a multidisciplinary, intercultural, and, inter and intergenerational series of installations and performances celebrating the history of Japantown in San Francisco, uh, which was formed in 1906. The project sought to deepen and expand community engagement Mentor the next generation of artists, such as the capital J dash tells, eight art apprentices, and preserve and perpetuate one of San Francisco's uh, histor essential historic neighborhoods. Unlike my other mandalas, this one was not an end in of, to itself, but a fractal part of a multifaceted look at the unique part of San Francisco. Where? The mandala and other art pieces were displayed at a large empty storefront in this Japan Center Mall from April 9 to May 28, 2015. The vacant commercial space was slated to be sold along with other major venues. The sale to new developers further threatened the future development of San Francisco, Japantown. Displaying the mandala, there was, an art, was, there was an art of defiance and also served to educate the viewers to the plight of this community. There are only three Japan towns left in the United States and all are in California. Little Tokyo in Los Angeles and Nihomachi in San Jose. The second fly close up, middle and interviews, photo by Bob Chiang. Japan town experienced a dramatic shift during World War II by the forced removal and incarceration of Japanese Americans. African Americans filled the labor shortage and moved into the vacated buildings. After the war ended in 1945, Japanese Americans returned to Japantown and settled into an Afro-Asian neighborhood in the early 50s. Shortly after, redevelopment of the Western Edition, that section of San Francisco was called Western Edition, began and forced hundreds of Japanese and African American residents out of their homes. The new Geary Boulevard corridor divided the neighborhood. This history is depicted in the Mandela through photographs of the roundup of the Japanese and silkscreen uh, posters protesting the eviction and displacement. Who? The mandala uh, involved the participation of people who had a relationship to San Francisco, Japantown, from JTELs and the Sweet JTown crews, to the longtime residents and shop owners who are part of the history, to those who belong to the Japantown community institutions, schools, churches, and social services on a daily basis. To those who participate in the workshops and art making sessions in the evenings or weekends, to those who visited the gallery during Cherry Blossom Festival, all unified by our connection to San Francisco, Japantown. The mandala contained photographs and uh, symbolic objects that represent the 109 year history of San Francisco, Japantown, 
with each layer reflecting the people, events, and stories of a particular era, era through photographs and four by six cards or uniform sized artifacts. The store bought items, handmade crafts, and original artwork by the community evoked the culture, history, and liveliness of the neighborhood. Some of the items were very special, such as the personal photographs of people who were in camps, in the camps, and candy wrapper cranes, uh, uh, cranes made from candy wrappers and flower baskets made by seniors over 50 years ago. There were also photographs of current Japantown act activities and businesses taken over by the younger artists in the project and friends, uh, j, -tells, uh, j Tells and friends, and handmade works of art by preschoolers in, at Nihomanchi Little Friends, youth at uh, JCYC, and seniors at Kimochi and Kokoro. Others lent objects from their homes. The J Tells helped me with the coordination of the art made as well as the creation of some of the crafts, such as the origami butterflies, felt sushis, and art cards. Some items were, brought, were bought from stores in the Japantown Mall and other businesses. Slide three. Second close-up, outer rings, photo by Bob Xiang. Uh, as we experience another current wave uh, of citywide redevelopment in San Francisco and resulting displacement of ethnic communities, our intention was to raise awareness to the current development issues impacting Japantown through the arts. We hoped that people would realize that this neighborhood has a history and a culture worth preserving and will work together to ensure its survival. My mandala and the other art offerings by Sweet J-Town, such as an interactive pagoda, readings, panel discussions, and performances connected the generations of Japanese Americans through education and collective art making. The community took ownership of the mandala, which became a symbol of Japantown itself. <clears throat> Everyone who participated in the mandala didn't want me to dismantle it. They wanted to save it, and that sentiment transferred into an energetic desire to save Japantown itself. Today, Japantown is still vibrant with events in the Peace Plaza that were designed to draw traffic into the area. J Tells have integrated their intense experience with Sweet J Town into their future ventures. Some have become community leaders. My assistant Charlene Kelly went on to help me with several other mandalas. The storefront where the mandala was is still vacant with no permanent business occupying it, but is used as a pop-up store or gallery for various organizations. So in conclusion, AAPI artists are expressing themselves in many different ways, drawing on our cultural roots and ancestral experiences, but going beyond our usual modes of storytelling to offer fresh perspectives and insights. Art becomes not only a vehicle for self-expression or a reflection of the times, but also a means to unite and heal a community through direct involvement and collective ritual. People who worked on the mandala contribute to something larger than themselves. And my mandala itself contributed to something even larger. This impermanent and non-static mode of expression combined with hands-on participation lends itself to deeper reflections of community preservation and adaptation in the face of change. The art form has vast potential as a tool for education, affirmation, community building, and healing. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. My name is Arlen Wong. My studio sits on the land of the Lenape Hoking people in Brooklyn, New York. To ask the question, where are the Lenape now, is to begin understanding American history. Great being here. Uh, I see my son over there. Stanford was his grandfather's alma mater. 1950, MBA Phi Beta Kappa. He would be proud to see us here today. Dad was a Chinatown type of guy. MJ was his game. 
we would go down to his club and he would love to point out his wealthy friends. <laughs> See that guy with the hose in that jacket? That's Ho Yeo Lo. It's the oyster sauce man. He's a millionaire. I see my dad right now next to you, pointing at me, proudly saying, see that guy with the hose in the jacket? He's my, he's a millionaire. <laughs> uh, my topic, what price activism? My image, the iconic photo of Godzilla, taken in 1992 by Tom Finkelpearl. This photo could be titled, for one brief shining moment, there was Camelot, Asian American style. This photo was taken 30 years ago. There are two people in this photo who worked on Yellow Pearl out of the legendary basement workshop, Tamiya Arai and myself. That was 20 years before this photo. That adds up to 50 years ago. For those unfamiliar with Yellow Pearl, Pearl is a loose leaf package of writings and art in dialogue with the music and lyrics of Chrissy Jima, Nobuko Miyamoto, and Charlie Chin. Produced at basement in 1971, it coincided with the formation of Kearney Street Workshop in San Francisco. All this within the dawn of the Asian American movement. For those unfamiliar with Godzilla, Howie wrote the book on it. He knows what we had for lunch in 1992. <laughs> Godzilla was founded in 1990 and disbanded in 2001. Bing Lee, Margo Machida, and Ken Chu were the founders. Everyone else is after. We wanted to contribute to changing the limited ways Asian Pacific Americans participated in and were represented in society. We wanted inclusion on our terms. Right from the onset, it was, a, it was different. It was a gathering of old, and some older community groups, Basement, Asian American Art Center, Epoxy, ACT UP. We had young and even younger Asian Americans in the art field, all yearning to explore our common bonds, all ready to bust out in the art world. The hope to challenge the status quo, to establish our ground, to crush a few institutions in the process, most of all, to establish an international Asian, Asian American arts network. Lessons from the past. No 501c3 nonprofit. No formal structure. No requirement to be a member. No hierarchy. No strings attached. Never monolithic. For those of you who embrace inclusion, your day has begun. For those of you who do not want a piece of the pie and want to bake your own, we have hard work ahead. The photo. Let me introduce you to this very independent thinking group today. Margot Machida is front and center and present for this symposium. Margot continues her writing on Asian American artists that began in 1985 with Myths, epoxy art groups show at Basement Workshop. She wants to acknowledge Basement's late director, poet Fei Chang, for first encouraging her to write about fellow artists. Margot's current publications include essays for the retrospective exhibition, Carlos Villa, Worlds in Collision, and the Martin Wong Catalog Raisonné. Byron Kim on the far left. Byron is still teaching painting at Yale and is co-director with Lisa Siegel of the Yale Norfolk School of Arts. Lisa and Byron also raised three kids together and like to play Padut Weiji Go, the supreme board game. Other than, other than that, Byron is still trying to figure out how to make a good painting. <laughs> Next to Byron is Bing. Bing Li continues to be the constant globetrotter with a studio in Shanghai, a place in Hong Kong, and a home in Bushwick, New York. Next to Bing is Eugenie Tsai. Eugenie is now the John and Barbara Vogelstein Senior Curator of Contemporary Art at the Brooklyn Museum. Just below Eugenie is Karen Higa, crossing her arms. Karen passed in 2013. Her legacy overflows. Howie holds much love for Karen, and she will be referenced by all of you throughout this symposium. 
That's me next to Karen. My grandmother, Emily Li Fong, was a founder of the Chinese YWCA. The building they commissioned in 1930 now belongs to the Chinese Historical Society of San Francisco. Next to Margo is Charles Yun. Charles remains engaged in the intimate relationship between layers of identity and layers of paint. Bonds beginning in 1981 have taken root. In short, surviving and working hard to make paintings that engage the nooks and crannies of our social, personal, political selves. Next is Janet Lin. I haven't heard from Janet in many years, uh, but I'm sure she'll pop up and say hello. That's Helen O.G. with the tilting head. Helen continues to infuse her studio practice with an eclectic amalgam of influences from Western and Eastern cultural traditions by incorporating her daily and imagined experiences, including abstraction, color, dance, and poetry. She recently exhibited two flags as public art. That tall guy in the back is Colin Lee. Colin says, just say, Colin's still alive, working in New York. But I will say his father is Kim Lee, the consummate Chinatown photographer of old San Fran. And his mother is the legendary Stella Wong, trailblazing artist poet from Berkeley. Her mural from Fong Fong Bakery resides in the Chinese Historical Society. On the far right, with the long clinging hair, is Tomia Arai. Tomia continues to live and work in New York. She is a founding member of the Chinatown Art Brigade and the activist archive, APA Voices, a COVID-19 public memory project. At 73, Tamiya returned to the workforce this year as the first artist in residence at CAV, Committee Against Anti-Asian Violence. Below Tamiya is Garson Yu. Garson is the founder and artistic director of YU and Company in Hollywood. He continues to break new ground in the field of digital media. And that's Ken Chu with fist to cheek. Ken Chu will always be the heart and soul of Godzilla. Ken is the original source for uh, Howie's book, Godzilla Asian American Arts Network. Ken is doing well and continues to live in the West Village, NYC. In moving forward, he has left art making and the art world in his wake. He remains my hero. On January 18, 2019, Herb Tam and Ryan Wong from the Museum of Chinese in America, MOCA, officially announced they would be organizing an historical exhibition on Godzilla. Their excitement was palpable. The reunion was magic. All went well until it didn't. Within a year, MOCA and the Chinatown community were at odds over the borough-based jail plan in NYC. One was to be built in Chinatown. Some Godzilla artists supported the community, some supported MOCA. After a year of intense deliberations, 11 Godzilla artists requested MOCA to engage the Chinatown community in an open forum moderated by a neutral facilitator. It was an opportunity for MOCA to explain in public how they received $35 million as a community give back in connection with the borough-based jail plan. MOCA said no. On March 5th, 2021, 19 out of 33 Godzilla artists withdrew from the show. March 9, Herb Tam announces the cancellation of the Mocha Godzilla show. Godzilla was never monolithic. To this day, we disagree with what went down. But Godzilla defends the right to voice, to be defiant, and to always question. In the soft but powerful words of Fred Korematsu, if you have the feeling that something is wrong, don't be afraid to speak up. In closing, I would like to bring into the room people from Godzilla who have left us. Mo Bach, Alice Yang, <clears throat> Tony Wong, Karen Higa, Rumi Suda, Martin Wong, and a great friend to Godzilla, Holly Block. 
my yellow pro friends who, have, who live in my heart. Richard K. Wong, Chris Sejima, Alex Chin, Fei Chang, Fei Chiu Matsuda, Corky Lee, Jeff Lee, Bob Takashi Yanikita, and a friend who knew us all, Lisa Okubo. We have history. We stand on rich earth. Thank you very much, and we love you madly. Um, my talk today centers on a blank image, not a glitch or a technical failure. The blank image begins as a provocation, reflecting upon the open question of the category of Asian American, a two-headed paradox of geography between Asia and the United States. I begin with a quote from Suzette Min's book, Unnameable, The Ends of Asian American Art in which she ponders the very predicament posed for the scholar and curator who confronts the term. The Asian American curator is now burdened with the task of brokering and preserving works of Asian American art, under pressure to racially profile and filter, discover and display a diverse array of new Asian American artists, and at the same time, to link older artworks to a historical avant-garde or to some other received art historical tradition in order to maintain upkeep and increase the value of such works, I am, as a curator and writer about Asian American art, experiencing a disquieting ambivalence. Unquote. I share this ambivalence as I'm invited to this incredibly lustrous group of scholars and artists today, with which I'm so honored to be in dialogue with over the course of this seminar, an intense privilege to be in such a room. Yet this sense of gratitude and honor is also twinned with an open reluctance towards accepting such an invitation. What project are we building together? Can an aesthetic and a consensus of politics be assumed or formed through identity? Is it simply enough to see ourselves such as a subject in a Hollywood film or an artwork in a major American museum that repairs our historical exclusion in American publics or a national canon? Conscripted to reform American nationalism through multiculturalism, how do we not become in danger of defanging the politics of artworks through canonization? or become accomplice in renewing the legitimacy of an institution. In the words of historian Lisa Lowe, quote, the production of the multicultural at once, quote, forgets, and in this forgetting, exacerbates a contradiction between concentration of capital within a dominant class group and the unattended conditions of a working class increasingly made up of heterogeneous immigrant, racial, and ethnic groups. Let's return, unquote. Let's return to the two-headed paradox of Asia and America. If we were to deconstruct the category of Asian American art, if only simply by these descriptors of geography. 90% of the workers who built the transcontinental railroad, as Gordon Chang writes, uh, were Chinese and up to 20,000 originated from the Pearl River Delta. Hundreds of Chinese workers were also hired to help construct Stanford University on unseceded ancestral land of the Muikma Ohlone people. These facts lay the material history of the Asian worker being conscripted to construct the nation and the institution. The material framework which houses such a discussion today is undoubtedly a fraught one. And for me, underlines this next question. How may the contours of which we draw our own belonging in this country and to the American canon as artists and scholars underline a settler logic that obscures indigenous sovereignty and potentially misses altogether amidst critical conversations about colonialism, the simultaneities and density of colonial history in relation to the American empire? In the words of friends and collaborators, Adam Khalil, Zach Khalil, and Jackson Paulus, core members of New Red Order, a public secret society of rotating membership, the title of their artist space show last year, Feel at Home Here, unquote. A sinis uh, an anti-colonial provocation, a sinister dare. 
On the other head of this double-headed paradox of Asian American as a category, where, for us, does Asia begin? Does it begin in Palestine? After all, Edward Said, the author of such a monumental work as Orientalism to Asian Studies and Asian American Studies, is a Palestinian, was a Palestinian intellectual. On the other end, does our definition of Asia include Australia and Hawaii? If the, defin if the definition of Asian American identity opens up a discourse about solidarity, where might we see the bounds of our relations? Moreover, when we talk about Asian studies or Asian American studies, we must reckon with how often such frameworks disproportionately center East Asia that obscure the epistemologies and histories of South Asia and Southeast Asia. The questions I'm asking here, many scholars and artists in the same room have asked for decades, but for such questions, they endure and renew in new times. And as ever, it is dizzying to traverse the expanse of time, space, and many-headed consciousness that the term of Asian American asks us to imagine. Geography resides at the heart of these riddles. Perhaps when thinking about the title of Lisa Lowe's book, The Intimacies of Four Continents, that as it were, colonialism has wrought the intimacies of these histories through violence, trade, and war, there is an opposite phrasing of Lowe's title that still feels salient, that colonialism and the project of liberal area studies posits a profound alienation of four continents, and the amnesia and severance of histories through war, displacement, and assimilation. As Asian Americans, what is our physical and conceptual distance to Asia? What, our, what are our own fantasies about Asia? As Grace Ting observes, quote, with its Cold War origins and existing struggle to grapple with questions of race and imperialism, Asian studies possibly feels like a less than likely site for radical solutions, unquote. Anyway, what does such categorization vis-a-vis -vis area studies service? While some might categorize, categorize me as a Hong Kong artist, or maybe even boldly as a Chinese artist, others might deem me as an American artist. Still, one might exclude me from each of these labels altogether. In the end, what, no, what narrative does any such label serve? I'm interested in flipping this coin of visibility and invisibility. This provocation of a, blank, of a black image takes up an attempt to summon a political imagination towards the unseeable, the unarchived, the inconvenient, or the contradictory. If identity politics is, in the words of Michael Warner, a, quote, way of overcoming both the denial of public existence that is often the form of domination and incoherence of the experience that domination creates, unquote, how may we claim or produce different forms of public existence? This image as gesture owes acknowledgement to notions of black art and abstraction from how to see a work of art in total darkness. Darby English states, quote, for in order to be visible or understood as a work of art, black art must, must concede in some involvement with the conceptual, linguistic, and historical means by which something becomes so visible or understood beyond black representational space, imagines that the history of black art in America as an institution of refusal, too frequently bent on ordering as a distinct series, a range of phenomena that when approached differently, enable us to discover chance, the discontinuous, and the materiality at their very roots." Unquote. How can thinking beyond visibility also open up the aperture for alternate me methodologies, or perhaps attend, as it were, to other forms of radical methodology through an attunement of ghostly presences of history beyond any singular standardized, standardized telling that obscures another? If it were not simply to summon ourselves, what are, what are other methods to materialize a cultural form or restless histories in experimental forms to embrace incoherence? Beyond the permissions of genre, nation, or institution, this black image as form is as withholding of information as it offers up a space of contestation. 
this image is as much to confront absence as it is to reorient ourselves through a material that is both blank and black, empty as it is dense, withholding information as it is reflexive. This blank image is in fact taken from my latest short film, What Rules the Invisible? a film that takes amateur travelogue footage of Hong Kong shot between the 1930s and 1970s in the city and edits these in juxtaposition to intertitles of my mother retelling her memories as a child of post-war Hong Kong. Soundtracked by the sounds of cicadas, the short takes the rhythm of a silent film. Image, 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 text. Image, 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 text. My mother's retellings are rendered in bold. Ghosts of prisoners of war from Japanese occupation haunting the police station. Sikhs who were conscripted by the British as a method of deflecting anti-colonial sentiment. The sanitary worker who would make regular rounds to dump out the pots of excrement in lieu of plumbing. In dizzying juxtapos juxtaposition, home movies more idyllic and more present in the popular memory of Hong Kong appear vividly. Such scenes are widely familiar, cliches even. Drunk boats in the sea, scenes of busy commuters shuffling in the streets, high rises in dramatic uh, relief against a landscape of mountains. Alongside, myth and superstition become vessels that contain the memory of violence and colonial history, which are absent in the images, but alive in oral history. In What Rules the Invisible, montage becomes a method by which to force the viewer to hold the active tension between the gaze of the travelogue home movies and my mother's childhood recollections of an adult world, a residue of history she was just learning, a space between image and absence. Anmi Lee once reflected, the camera has provided me with multiple shields from the, pain, from the painful memory of war while allowing me to come as close as possible to understand it, unquote. It was through learning the translation of the term my Judzai when writing my artist book, Too Salty, Too Wet, that helped me understand that my great-grandfather was sold along with his two brothers as coolies as a collection of piggies, literally, from the Chinese province of Fujian to the Malay Peninsula to work in open, tit, open pit tin mining. Occluded or obscured through shame or translation, yet more riddles remain in my lineage. Another, born on October 1st, 1949, my dad was adopted. For decades, we didn't know who his family was until I recently found his biological father an Italian-American naval officer who was stationed in Shanghai in the 1940s and later died in Okinawa after fighting in the Korean War. My grandfather is buried in the National Cemetery in Long Island within an hour of where I currently live. His, place sits, his picture sits on my dresser. It is my own family history that exceeds the coherent, which perhaps explains the root of my own intense skepticism towards categorization through any modern notion of geography or place. Slipping across countries and continents to tell such a story of my lineage of multiple centuries of port cities between cycles of dispossession and affluence demands a challenge to tell it beyond a naturalized vision of history through a single national or continental framework. It is the history of port cities where such people and materials across continents were bound by brutality as they were entwined through intimacy. Flipping a coin of visibility and invisibility, legibility and illegibility, the empty and the dense, this blank image is a placeholder for a cultural category that begs to exceed geography and nationalism against the monumental, beyond the figurative or slick narrative, beyond genre, on its own inconvenient, restless, and bastard terms. Thanks so much for having me. Can, uh, is this on now? All right, great. So I want to go up to the podium. And thank you, uh, panelists, for terrific presentations. Uh, I'm just going to sit and, and, and give some observations to our panelists and to you, and then hope, uh, invite them to respond, and then have uh, uh, receive the little postcards I hope some of you are filling out. I, I first want to thank the symposium organizers and my colleagues, Marcy Kwan and Alyssa Alexander. This has been just a thrill for me to be involved, and I appreciate it very much. I really do see this as a historic 
and path-breaking event. I think this is just a seed in a sense, and all sorts of wonderful things will come from, I am sure. And so I'm so honored to be involved, and I thank you also for you have the opportunity to bring me together with some, so many old friends and colleagues, from Mark to Margot, uh, Dorothy, and others who are in this room. So thank you, uh, Marcy and Alisa. Um, thank you to all the panelists for their eloquent remarks that inspire us to think creatively and originally. As you've heard, they do not rely on time-worn rubrics, but present provocative commentaries on individual life, identity, personal and social, and art. I am not an artist or a specialist in art history, nor am I a curator. I am a historian of a rather traditional bent, but my lifelong interests, but with lifelong interests in art, politics, and identity. My thoughts here follow, reflect my academic trajectory, but also my own personal journey. I loved hearing the stories from our panelists. I knew many of the artists and organizations that you mentioned. My parents and myself were connected to Hong Kong, Taiwan, Shanghai, New York City, and San Francisco, and points in between. Uh, in many ways, our speakers challenged us with sharp questions and not with blunt conclusions or resolutions. And I'm sure many of our audience will have, uh, have been provoked to ask for further comment or offer challenging perspectives. Uh, my overall impression is that the panelists, in many fundamental ways, point to fundamental tensions. And this has been raised to what we've called Asian American art, capital A, three A's, that are still unresolved. These tensions were evident when the Asian American arts movement began in the late 1960s. I'm sorry, Nancy Hom is not here. She was really one of the originators of the Asian American arts movement. These questions remain with us. What is Asian? Where is Asia? I love the map that was shown earlier. It was showing Asia, that half of the world kind of cut up between a pink section and a white section. I forget whose section was that. that, that. You know, where is Asia? Where is America? Uh, what is Asian America? Is it even a thing? After all, the term Asian America was a deliberate provocation given coined by a historian, by our friends, or I can call him my friend, Yuji Ichioka back in, at UC Berkeley in 1968 when he was a graduate student. He was trying to think, what are we going to call ourselves when we march in this anti-war demonstration tomorrow? We're not going to be called the Orientals against the war. <laughs> We're going to be calling ourselves Asian Americans against the war. And that's where the term came from. Uh, it remains to this day what can be called a claim on society. What is art? What should it do? if I can even ask that question. If we historicize art, that is to place art pieces in historical context and think about aesthetics. We haven't talked much about aesthetics, and maybe that's something the panelists can talk about. If aesthetics are deeply embedded in history and society, how should we think about aesthetics beyond context? But further, what is Asian American art activism? Are we speaking about politics, cultural politics? Activism suggests politics. If now everything that sins in our world seems to be political, from presidential politics to uh, everyday uh, uh, school board issues. Or po everything is political, it seems. And culture is everything. Everything seems to be culture. Uh, the politics of social transformation, uh, are we speaking about art? And the murder of Vincent Chin, now 40 years ago, continue to pose. 40 years ago, June 19th, 1982. 40 years ago, Vincent Chin died. We still talk to him about him. I remember the date well, because June 19th is my birthday. What is the relationship between art and social transformation? Many years ago, when the Asian American movement began, many of us went forward on different paths seeking the elusive goal of, quote unquote, liberation, freedom, equality. That, there was the hard ideological politics of revolution. Some of us here in this room remember those hard ideological politics. But there was also the power of sharing personal revelation, 
about culture and individual identity. That was sort of the political, that was the, that was the cultural direction. Art and activism. They seemed different, even antithetical at that time, but not so much now, at least in my view. The art our panelists shared with us today exemplify the provocative power of art as it speaks to real lives, experiences, and place in society and history. Art for our panelists is activism. But I have just one question to pose to the panelists. I asked many questions above, but I'll end this uh, remarks with this one question. Can you expand on the subject of the panel, art and activism? What is the relationship of art and activism to you? Definitely. Yeah, can you hear me? Um, I don't identify as an activist. That's happened to me a few times um, where I've been accidentally labeled an activist. I think some work that I have done in the past, such as mutual aid um, or other projects that I can't necessarily go uh, publicly talking about, uh, can be labeled as such. But I think also there's a lot of material political work that actually must rely on hiding in plain sight, and I think uh, under the title of an artist is actually um, one of the most successful ways that one can hide in plain sight. Um, and uh, yeah, I have a lot of ambivalence, I think, in terms of taking up the mantle of sort of activist with a capital A. Um, I don't know if the sort of professionalization of it and the kind of, and I don't, I don't, I guess for me, I think this also is adjacent to the question of what it means to be a political artist. What is political about political films? What is political about political art? Um, how when pairing those two words together, what are you actually saying about the power of art to change, to, create material political change. And I hold a lot of doubt for that. And I'm not necessarily trying to be nihilistic or pessimistic. I'm not trying to condemn the sort of pessimism, but it's more about um, seeing a separation, I think, of what um, the radical pointlessness of art, <laughs> the radical poetic possibilities of art um, versus material direct action. <laughs> This work? Okay. Um, I just wa also wanted to piggyback off of the comments. I, I also don't, that's why I also wanted to kind of rename this panel to, to activisms, the different forms, because um, I don't also identify as being an activist, but I, I'm interested in the software that goes, that has kind of been underlying transformative or um, uh, movements or, or, or efforts. So. If one of the one of the key software to to what we're talking about, if the Asian American movement is, is bringing in a historical material analysis to American society or to imperial imperialism, um, that's something that I want to take up. That's the baton. When we're talking about batons, not necessarily the baton of professionalism or or ladder climbing. It's, it's about kind of investigating and, and questioning and 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 updating that software and, and renewing. Um, things like categories of Asian American, which I think was a tool, a provisional kind of architecture. It's like a FEMA architecture that's not meant to to live on besides, you know, the the kind of the sustenance that and and shelter that was needed. So really, kind of taking that up and and, and kind of looking at the house that was built, and then seeing if it's adequate or if there's contradictions that need to be addressed. If, that there are other spaces that we can build too. And the other thing that I'm interested in too, renewing is the idea that all art is radical or just being Asian or African American itself, being in, in American society merits a radicality just by pure being. Um, I think that's something that, I think in the past, as say, I don't know what the, as minoritized groups, there was this kind of speech act to say, well, everything we're doing is radical because we're not seen or disenfranchised. But I think now that um, we've achieved 
you know, to be real, certain visibilities and, and privileges that to utter that just by being or making from a s specific subject position is radical, I think is not nuanced enough to, to um, have fidelity to the transformative legacies of the past. Arlen, do you have anything to add? Is it on? Yes, it is on. Well, I'm actually kind of talked out. <laughs> John, John Yao says he's 72 and he's charged. I'm 74 and I'm sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I would like to say that, um, you know, my brand of activism, my brand of, of uh, political art is, is old. I mean, you know, we're talking 50 years ago. And uh, when I listened to Tiffany, when I listened to Howie, and so many more young people, that it, is, it is so encouraging because, like, Tiffany today has raised the level in terms of definitions. Um, and those definitions have to be dealt with. Um, during my time, Asian American is good enough, right? But it is not anymore. And I think when we were talking earlier, um, I've, I've been asking this question, how does my generation, a lot of people in my generation, how are they now, what did I say? <laughs> that they have become the people we used to protest against. <laughs> so that's, that's the question that's been bothering me lately. Uh, but it's up to all you young people. And I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about it. Well, thank you all three. I'm really quite surprised by the answers. <laughs> you know, I didn't really expect it. But thank you for being very candid. We have uh, time for some questions. Hopefully, we've got two. All right. Uh, all right, let, let's, uh, the first question is, sort of continues this discussion. What is, should, what is or should be the goals of activism? Uh, so the refinement of the question was just posed. Feel free to say why this may be the wrong question, which maybe it is. So maybe you guys already answered it. Yeah, maybe you already answered it. So I don't know if you want to say any more. No, I, 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 I'm really quite surprised, shocked, because I see a big generational divide. I, I'm, I'm with Ara, you know, I, I, I heard a lot of activism. I, I thought, uh, and Nancy, I mean, all of the three artists who presented, other than Arlen, I saw, I heard a lot of uh, the interrelationship between activism, that is commentary, reaction, response, um, uh, suggestion about uh, something that's wrong in society. I mean, I call that sort of an activist and the propelling of, uh, of, 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 creativ of creativity is being inspired by wanting to change something. So that's sort of like I was coming from. But the, but the, the, the younger generation doesn't seem to agree. Oh, I, I, think <laughs> I'll, I'll, I think we're on the same page. I All think right. it's about, that's what my intro is about the forms it takes, you know, whether it's collective or the quantum individual. Um, we, I think activism, we're on the same page about emancipation, uh, addressing dispossession, and decreasing suffering in the world. Like, you know, you, you know um, we're doing this in material and immaterial forms, visible and invisible forms, like, you know, Tiffany really kind of pushing the edges of, of of what we consider discursive Asian American field, or what activism looks like, not like you know blank image, or even the refusal, like some something like Jared Liu's um, photographs, in which it's so overdetermined by, like the Vincent Chin thing, like, it's just it's so magnetic that you can't see anywhere, anywhere or any way to produce art other than from that space of of that Asian American tragic narrative. And the idea is to, to, to kind of explode that um, into other possibilities and forms. So that's the type of activism yeah. too. And also, I mean, we're not activists, but we're also involved in projects that, yeah. that are materially about emancipation, dispossession, uh, treating, you know, addressing dispossession and, 
and decreasing suffering. So I think it's really kind of creating a, a, a um, to really kind of map out new forms in addition to not invalidating you know, traditional collective um, activisms that you see on TV. Thanks, thanks, Howard. Tiffany, you want to jump in? I have a question. It's a really good ending question, so, but you first. Um, I also, yeah, to your point, just this idea of like activism being some sort of specialized work. I think like many people do maybe more in also invisible forms of political work. Um, so I think it's to really open up that definition. Um, I mean, even writing that film quarterly essay, Phantasms of Descent, on those two uh, films by anonymous, the anonymous collective of Hong Kong documentary filmmakers, it was in response to this like lack of scholarship or formal study of these films simply as films. And it was, I felt like I was kind of role playing as a film writer um, to recover their belonging in film history, what they're doing to unsettle documentary as a form when everybody else was so attached to the fact that sensationally this idea of like the films are banned, the films are banned, and that's all they could say about it. One more comment too. I just want to also address Ireland about like, you know, there, it's not, there's no generational divide or we're actually very, very, um, I'm invigorated by the energy of that history. And our job, I think, is to kind of like look at the, the legacy and also to convert that energy and to address the contradictions that have emerged from, let's say, something like Asian American as a category or, or Asian American art as, as a thing to, I mean, I think the, the radical project of the late 60s into the 70s was to denaturalize what seems natural, right? So Asian American as a category was a provisional term to get political agency, right? And somehow over the course of 30 years, it's become a naturalized category as a way of, essential way of being, you know, a way of storytelling that, that seems to require some questioning. And I, that's where the software from the 60s and 70s and become really important to, to denaturalize what is presented as, as, as the norm. I, I would like to echo what uh, Dorothy was saying a while ago, where uh, it's, it's a lot of people. Activism is, is it's not a formula. There's, there's no uh, right way, there's no wrong way. Um, there's, no, there's not just one way. It's, it's many ways and it's many people that, that has brought us to this point. Good. Uh, I, I, uh, we got uh, on the topic uh, uh, in a deeper way. Now, here's the, here's the final question, which I think is, I really invite you guys to think about this, and everybody in the audience. Given the momentum of the attack on critical race theory, you've been reading the newspapers, as hopefully you know what we're talking about here, there's an attack on, critical, on the teaching of criti so-called critical race theory. How do you see the art world's Responding. It's an interesting question. I mean, in some sense, what do, how do all of us respond? I mean, there's this uh, counterattack, if you will, on the teaching of F critical race theory is sometimes we use as a term to substitute for ethnic studies, for talking about diversity or equality. And I mean, it's a it's a term, a very loaded term. Uh, but uh, there's, there's a very, very strong uh, movement now to ban, to attack, to undermine, criticize critical race theory. So what is the responsibility of any uh, that artists or, or activists uh, bear in responding to this movement? Recover and assert knowledge systems. I think a lot of artists that I work alongside and I'm inspired by do exactly that through moving image form um, and through performance, for example. Um, but I think when thinking about something like critical race theory, it is alongside other programs of like trying to kill knowledge. Um, and I think artists, political artists, do the work of often trying to unsettled archives or to assert other 
objects into the archives that demand the existence of those um, knowledge fields. So, um, and then the curators who, and the film festivals that program that work, or also the film festivals and the curators who don't program that kind of work. Um, yeah. I, I, would, I would agree with that totally. But I, I would also say that just because you're an artist don't make you right on. There's a lot of artists that uh, <laughs> I would disagree with totally. So there you go. <laughs> How are we gonna have last word? Okay, so like, this is a huge topic and I think we work in the field of arts and aesthetics, right? So it's what we have in our, in our wheelhouse is symbols, gestures, and, and sensibilities, you know? So, um, I'm just thinking like the critique of um, critical race theory coming from the right and also from, it comes from the left too. You know, it's about the institu institutionalization of, of, of something, right? Whatever it is, this idea of, of race. Um, and I think within our wheelhouse of the arts, you know, is to really kind of push that in, in the ways that we're doing now, discursively, materially, um, historical materially too, um, that we can kind of start organizing new ways of being and understanding being in the world together. And I think that's what people want in general, you know, so I think it's the ossification of, of, of categories. And I was just thinking this is like kind of, if you can indulge me, like we're all staying at the Sheraton, like in all of us, um, you know, and there's this very specific um, soap that they have in every room <laughs> and it's called warm oak you know and it has a smell that it's like very specific to sheraton and marriott and stuff like that and i was just thinking like okay you know we're going to an asian american conference but everybody who's staying there smells the same <laughs> because we all use the same shampoo right so what if we can rethink about us being on panels not as asian americans but people who smell like warm oak <laughs> A reordering of the senses of the smell, not through categories or essential identities of our diasporic self. As absurd as it is, it's really kind of like what we do as in the arts, right? Kind of like thinking about the sensorial, the historical and material. There's a reason why we're here. It's not like smelling like warm milk. It's not historical materially <laughs> determined. Um, so like those are the, these ways of maybe loosening um, ways of being and, and even explaining why we're together which is warm oak. <laughs> well, on that note about scent and smell, we will have to end, unfortunately, but I hope uh, this panel uh, has provided lots of th stuff for you guys out there in the audience to think about. I know I have lots of things to think about and uh, go out and uh, try to address some of the questions that have been posed, the topics that were addressed today. They're very difficult, good topics. Thank you all.